Okay. Hello. Hello. Okay, we did get it to work. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Fantastic. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. I feel like it has been literally years since we've spoken. It has been years. Yes. It has been a long time. I am excited for this show. Alex is here. Danielle got everything set up and started for us, so that's good. You sound fantastic, by the way. (laughs) Oh, it must be all that lack of sleep. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I feel you there. So I've never used this Twitter Spaces. Thank you for introducing me to this new function. And I'm looking forward to seeing how it works. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's really just kind of like a live audio podcast, um, as you know, as opposed to something that's pre-recorded and and put out into the universe. This is all kind of live. And then we... uh, this will be available for about a month or so on Twitter. And, uh, and then I, I take this audio and I turn it into a, an actual podcast that goes out onto SoundCloud and, and Google and Apple and all of that and lives on until the end of time. Okay. Well, that sounds great. And- and I just realized I was trying to talk and, and get things started. I'm supposed to just sort of fill the opening minutes with promoting CASA and uh, announcing you, our guest, Dr. Glover. Um, sh- is, is, it, is, is, is Dr. Glover okay or would you prefer Mariwa? Dr. Dr. Glover's fine or Mariwa, yeah. Okay. Um, and so since this is recorded, I'll, I'll get into it. Um, you know, we can uh, obviously, while I'm speaking, wait for people to show up, but um, I should probably go ahead and dive into it. I know your time is precious, um, Dr. Glover. So uh, and uh, so for those who are uh, just listening to this uh, on the recording or maybe joining while I'm speaking in the next 30 seconds here, um, welcome to our Twitter space with Dr. Mary Wa Glover. Uh, and of course, we're going to be talking about um, uh, whether or not youth smoking is over or not. And of course, uh, a new piece of research published by Dr. Glover and Dr. Carl Phillips, um, looking at the uh, effects or not effects of uh, the ongoing anti-smoking, anti-vaping campaigns. Um, so uh, just to introduce our guest, uh, Dr. Mary Wall Glover is the director of the Independent Center of Research Excellent, Excellence, Indigenous Sovereignty and Smoking, based in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, this is, a, of course, uh, a, a funded by the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World uh, and is looking to reduce the harms, working to adu- reduce the harms associated with tobacco use among all Indigenous people globally. Uh, and I, I have to, to also note, I think, uh, out of everybody I've I've crossed paths with um, in the past, how long have I been doing this? Um, seven, eight years. Um, I, I think you are probably one of the the very few uh, indigenous people involved in this. Uh, and of course, with the stakes so high, thank you for all of your work and um, and welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to join you and. Uh, been feeling very isolated down here in New Zealand with our very strict um, closure of our borders and if you you could leave but you could never come back sort of thing. (laughs) So I'm really looking forward to uh, everything. You're moving along, um, people getting better, healing and, and and attending conferences again, meeting some of you in person. Yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward to doing a little bit of traveling here. I, I'm just on the border with Canada, so we've been going through that drama for two years, and finally things are relaxing. Um, so, you know, we're able to get up and see family members there. Um, and, I, and, and, of course, my sympathies for being locked down on an island in the middle of the ocean. Um, but, um, yeah, it, 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 if uh, maybe we can get right into it. And um, 
I guess a good place to start is the the, the new bit of, of research that, that you and, and Carl put out. Um, is any of this stuff working? Does it has it made a damn bit of difference in the past 50 years or are we just burning money? Thank you so much for focusing on this important paper. And it's an idea that you know, Carl had been wanting to tackle for some time. And in New Zealand as well, I early on uh, figured out that parental smoking was a key, I guess, uh, driver of youth uptake of smoking, initiation, trialing, smoking, and then continuing to smoke. So my focus has always been more on older people who smoke, parents especially, and I guess because I came into it focusing on reducing death and disease rather than pushing prohibition or some kind of moral imperative. So I was focusing on reducing death and disease. Where is that? Well, pregnant mums, um, you've got immediate potential harm. So they were my number one group. And the next group were people who had been smoking for a long time so you know who are already experiencing disease they need to be the second priority group for intervention and then the third group were parents especially parents of young children but that of course is not what tobacco control decided to do (laughs) and they have um, primarily focused on youth uh, especially because smoking prevalence tends to be highest among the 18 to 25-year-old group, uh, 18 to 30-year-old group. And because smoking was the highest, they thought, well, that's where we'll target. But that's also where quitting rates are not as high. Um, So I haven't really been on the same um, wavelength with tobacco control in terms of where we should have prioritised. I always thought that parents were where we need to put a lot of effort, especially parents of children your age, zero to seven. But um, And Carl had that similar idea about parents and what, would, what was the effect of all of the ha- early health education. So this idea of shocks or this echo, well, all those parents that quit in 1960s that means there's going to be less kids taking up in the next generation and so on and so on. So that's what he set out to model. Yeah, and I, I, I really like I, some of the, the language in, in the, 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 your, your, y'all's report is, um, well, a couple of the things I, I, I like. The, the idea of social contagion, for sure. Um, I've been guilty of that. I was, I was the smoker on my hall in college. And so anybody who was trying to quit or didn't want to smoke knew that they really shouldn't be hanging out with me. Um, and uh, the other thing is this, this echo effect, this, this sort of, you know, echo through the generations. Um, you know, I think a lot of us sort of instinctively realized that, you know, it was our parents that had probably the most significant effect on whether or not we, we chose to smoke. Um, and it, it seems like you know, the, your work and, and you and Carl's work should should really kind of blow the lid off this thing. I mean, we, now it seems like we have probably even more confirmation. I mean, this is already in the literature uh, in terms of I, I can't remember the, you know, the, the, the multiple of, you know, how many more times uh, children of, of a parent who smokes uh, are likely to go on and smoke. But, um, you know, that that being kind of my impression of this is, you know, have you have you guys gotten any reaction from folks in tobacco control? Is your phone ringing off the hook? Did, did uh, Australian or I'm sorry, New Zealand media or even American media reach out to you guys and say, hey, this sounds like a pretty big story? Uh, no, no, dead silence. Unfortunately, the paper came out uh, pretty much over New Year's when, you know, in healthcare uh, and tobacco control all on holidays. So. We got no response from the media. A lot of media are on holidays at that time as well. Um, and, yeah, so it's it's just a matter of circulating it. Uh, I think it's not easy to read, I guess, because it's modelling. And, you know, certainly we've tried to make it accessible, but it is just modelling. And 
plugging numbers into a model and seeing what comes out. But modeling's very, very popular at the moment. And I think the general public has a little bit more understanding now about modeling because it was used so much uh, to model how many people were going to die of COVID and, you know, and to drive the severe lockdown measures that were implemented. So what Carl's done with these models is, is simulate and all the formulas are there. I think a study that I was involved with early on in New Zealand and looking at the effect of parental smoking, it basically went that if one parent smoked, then the offspring had a, you know, a certain chance of starting. If both parents smoked, then that doubled. And there were some effects by ethnicity as well. Um, the Interestingly, in New Zealand, if, if a child of Asian parents, and many, you know, men in Asian men smoke, but if a mother smoked, there was like a six times multiplicative effect. And that was very interesting. But it, in some ways, you know, smoking is often an ind indicator of other things. Um, it can be a proxy measure of other determinants or environmental factors. So, but it it is quite a strong effect. And he's plugged that in. I think that really the formula undercounts what would likely happen um, in terms of, okay, let's just say what a parent smokes and one child will start smoking, but not three of them, you know. And then the second effect that was added in was this effect of, of uh, a friend, co-worker or sibling quitting smoking. And the... Yeah, so that that's just saying one, if one person. But what if all your friends quit, you know, then it's going to be a strong effect. So it's quite a conservative simulation. And you could expect that um, some of the effects would have been more far-reaching, but then again it goes up and, up and down. So I was uh, surprised myself by the results that came out that showed that even just looking at parental smoking and through the generations, how, okay, then that cuts the uptake of smoking in the next generation and then the next generation after that. And it makes perfect sense in a way. Yeah, it does. And, and of course, you know, the, the, I, I think you guys made a note that, you know, the modeling is only, uh, taking place from, you know, 1965 up until 2010, because around 2010 is when vapor products started to become more prolific. Um, and of course, we've we've heard on this side, I, I don't know if this gets into a question, but, um, you know, one of the things that we heard from people when we were going to conventions and so on was, um, you know, parents who would come up and say, yeah, it was my, you know, young adult child that actually got me to quit smoking by switching to vaping, um, which was sort of that that inverse effect there. But also, uh, you know, certainly if you're if your kids and as you were mentioning, your social group are are quitting in mass, then that I, I think has an effect on it is socially contagious. <laughs> and those two things are accepted in tobacco control literature and in the sector. Those two factors have been around for a long time and were there's plenty of evidence to support those two say theories that if a parent smokes or parents smoke, well, it, it is more parent globally. It is more the males, but in some countries, uh, especially, you know, us and New Zealand, Australia, um, as many mums might smoke as well. It depends. It varies by, by ethnicity, of course, but, yeah, if if a parent smokes, then there's all that modelling and access to tobacco. Uh, it's it's normalised, and so that's well accepted. But along the way, it kind of got left to the side, you know. And so, I guess it was sort of annoying to Carl and I that every new intervention or every new policy that was being pushed, and they're increasingly 
harsh and severe and pushing prohibition and they were all sort of doing their own research on their own ideas you know nobody's sort of saying anything about bias and coming out saying yeah this was so effective you know like look we've reduced the smoking prevalence in the country by x percent and we're like uh hang on a minute it was reducing on its own anyway due to this natural kind of attrition of uh, parents giving up, their children not starting, then they they become parents and they don't smoke, so their children don't take up, and and so on. Plus, you have the the effect of those parents quitting and then their peers quitting. So it's that ripple effect or butterfly effect or whatever you want to call it. I think it's kind of would be seen as common sense, but in tobacco control scientific literature, it's never accounted for. It's not like, okay, well, if we say this much of the reduction in smoking in the country is caused by these this echo effect, how much is left for us to say, yep, our tax policy did that or our health messages did that or our mass media campaign did that? No, they they claim the whole thing. Yeah, and I, I guess it's tempting to want to to kind of poke holes in this, and and I don't think I'm going to be able to do a very effective job at that. But um, you know, in, in sort of controlling for all these other campaigns and interventions that we've been seeing, um, you know, sometimes when you know one of our casas, uh, um, and, and I'm, I assume a lot of other organizations share the same uh, opposition here, but you know, one of our oppositions to, for example, uh, indoor vaping bans is that it is a form of structural communication. Um, and so it, not, I'm not really applying this to vaping, but um, you know, for smoking, the indoor, indoor place bans generally, indoor or outdoor, um, I, I assume that, that, that folks in tobacco control also hopefully correctly identify that as a form of structural communication. Uh, and so is there not an argument for sort of re-upping these communications every so often, be it through policy or through, um, for example, the, the real cost campaign, uh, that, that somehow we all have the, the memory of, of goldfish and, and we just need to be reminded constantly? Uh, it, it, it did, did the study uh, account for that as part of, you know, maybe I'm just sort of imagining that, that curve, that downward trend um, that, you know, without those uh, reminders, if you will, um, that that initial shock of the Surgeon General's report wouldn't have carried through the generations. Did, did I make that a clear question? <laughs> yes, I think I, I understand what you're saying. So we had the Surgeon General's report and in the UK, they also had the Royal College of Physicians reports sort of slightly before that. Uh, but it was really the US Surgeon General's report that was televised around the world and was shocking news the way it was presented and, and, mass, and the media just, you know, spread that. So, OK, suddenly, you know, you've got around the world, everyone's got the definitive statement that smoking kills and that's a very simple statement it's a, and it's a true statement um and obviously you can go into oh but it doesn't kill everybody oh but you know but let's say now people have learned something and it's come from an authoritative source and that was enough to uh, cause people to okay well i'm going to quit and then some of the social contagion then takes over. People tell people you've got spread of word of mouth. Of course, you've got all of the medical professionals that that now go, oh, okay, well, I have a responsibility to help my patients quit smoking, to educate them. So it was more the education that then went out. And certainly back um, your few several decades ago, before we had sort of public health that we have now, we had health education programs and they did focus more on educating people about the effects of smoking. And somewhere along the line that got replaced by social um, marketing approach and, you know, just promote 
being smoke free and rather than educating. So I think the in the end uh, point we're trying to make is that 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 health education, helping people understand the effects of smoking, uh, and then power to them if they understand that they believe that they can understand how smoking is going into the lungs and damaging or whatever, uh, then usually, you know, have faith in people. They'll act on that if um, if they can and within their resources and given their circumstances, they will try to shift away from that. Yeah, I think I, I, I've i always, well, maybe not always, but I have certainly agree. And, 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 you know, it's when people first of all, treating people with respect and, 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 uh, and acknowledging their intelligence and ability to make their own decisions is a great place to start. Um, and that when people can really feel the truth of something that they will choose the, you know, the, the best course of action. Um, and, uh, I, I did want to, I've sort of been taking up all the time here. So I want to give, you know, uh, Matt or Logan or Danielle an opportunity to jump in if you guys have any questions. Yeah, I, I, um, and I apologize. I'm not super prepared for this. I just got home like 15 minutes before we started Mario. So if I say anything dumb, I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, what I have a teenager at home and, um, and I've around a lot of her friends and a few of them vape or have vaped. And I've, I've asked them d- different questions about it. And I'm always interested in picking their, their brains about the topic. Um, how much do you think just, you know, trends play a role here like it to them they just don't think smoking is cool i mean (laughs) it's it's looked down upon and you know i think maybe the education started that process of looking down upon smoking as being uncool but i i think a big you know they're still drinking and which is also unhealthy and can cause uh, dire effects for them but they it, it really seems to me like the the number one reason why from what i've seen is they're just not smoking because it's just not socially acceptable now. But vaping is more socially acceptable. And and oddly, they seem to understand the risks of the behaviors more than adults do because they'll tell you, you know, that they, vaping is not safe, but it's safer than smoking. And they, they seem to know those things uh, or be able to state it better than a lot of, uh, you know, their parents can. Yeah, I think uh, trends does have an effect. There definitely are trends. Uh, and that's that social contagion thing again where something takes off and, and you know, whether or not something just becomes a fad and then it wears out. Uh, I mean, obviously with smoking or vaping or alcohol or cannabis or, you know, we, we are talking about um, an activity where people are taking in a psychoactive substance. So it's not simply, say, um, planking or the ice challenge or something like that. I mean, there, certainly there's rewards of, of getting more coverage on social media or or likes for doing something that's trending. But we're talking here about using something where there's a psychoactive effect and for some people that the benefit of that may be um, dependency forming and to different degrees. And of course, everybody's circumstances affect how much something is going to be dependency forming. They may not need it at all uh, in their life and others do need to help or coping mechanisms. So definitely uh, curiosity was always a, a big factor, especially when I did my PhD 30 years and ago on why did people start smoking curiosity is something that gets people to have a go at something uh social being socially part of what everybody's doing is part of creating that curiosity but part of keeping it going i think i think what we've seen here in new zealand with our stats is a lot of people tried vaping a lot of young people and a lot of adults had a go so they had a a try of it it was fascinating um i mean i even tried it i wanted to understand about it but i didn't use uh, liquid with nicotine in it because i was still coming from that woo nicotine scary demon uh and you know so lots of people i mean i would say 
our stats show nearly half of Māori adults tried vaping. Well, not that many were smoking. So you've got a whole lot of people who don't even smoke who are trying vaping just to see what it's like. And a lot of them, although would be ex-smokers. So young people are going to try uh, mainly out of curiosity. And then if their friend circle uh, are vaping on a more regular basis, then they go along with that. And it really depends in terms of dependency forming on social determinants and circumstances and drivers of you know, the use of any psychoactive substance really for getting through your day. And some people don't need that and others do. Yeah. I, you know, it makes the education being the number one reason makes sense. It seems like that's what started everything else. What, and some of that was good and some of it was bad, but it, it, it made it less cool over time to smoke and, and less socially acceptable to smoke, but also you know, it's stigmatized existing smokers and now a lot of them aren't treated very well too. But, um, you know, I, I agree that education was kind of the root of everything. I think the education is kind of about like telling people facts and helping them understand, you know, that about smoking going in, what is in smoke and why is it doing damage? The not cool thing came with the use of... Uh, that was a deliberate, it was deliberate strategy, deliberate use of mass media to demonize people who smoke, to, to make it uncool. Well, it was made uncool by demonizing and stigmatizing people who smoked. I mean, I have posters from around Europe, like from 30 years ago, where a, a, and they're aimed at youth, and you've got five or six cool kids on one end of the of the seesaw and on the other is this one person who's isolated. It was deliberately done with strategies like that. And that's not really education. That's more about um, manipulating and yeah, it's, a, it's not a good way to push health behavior by stigmatizing yeah. people and well, demonizing. Well, and oddly I, I was a, a teen in the nineties and our smoking rates were pretty damn high. My generation um, I think it was around, it topped out at around like 25% or something. But, uh, um, you know, they, they did a lot of the same thing. Smoking's not cool. Drugs aren't cool back then. But my generation kind of went the other way and rebelled against it. Uh, and so, I, it, it, but it, maybe it just took, you know, a few generations for all that to kind of take root and sprout, I guess. Or maybe each generation just kind of got a little smarter about smoking. I'm, I don't know. Well, it, like with this paper where we show that prevalence goes down and down and with each generation, and so there are less and less people smoking with each generation. There are still people who rebel. There are still people who do not like the manipulative technique, the bullying, and and they resist. So even among our participants in our Voices of the 5% study, which is all on the case stories are online, there are definitely people in there who are like, I don't like what they're doing. And they actively resist. So they hang on to smoking um, as a rebellious act. It's also about that you know, embodiment and and power of your own body or, or wanting to feel autonomy. And when people are feel feel they're bullied, then they do resist that. So it's a balance uh, to get it right um, in terms of health education. What we're saying is what's really important is that people do have those education, those facts about the effects of smoking. Um, there are a lot of people in the world who now only get the stigmatizing, demonizing stuff. They don't get the education. They haven't had it um, in some low middle income countries, for example. They're getting the message it's not cool, it's not okay, or um, but they they didn't get the health education on how smoking damages your lungs or how it is damaging your health. And so it makes sense that they're just going to look and go, well, I don't like you 
bullying me like this or I don't, I don't agree with your behavior. Um, and I, I think smoking's fine. So in some places, the approach that's now being used, say, in the U.S., or in New Zealand or Australia, where they're after just a, a small percentage of minority now who smoke and doing it with that demonizing, stigmatizing approach. In low middle income countries where they are copying that current approach we're using, but they missed out the first step and they haven't done the education. That's what we're trying to say. Find groups that don't understand the effects and how that happens make sure they get that education and then you'll see this effect of quitting flow through those generations for them as well yeah I, oh danielle did you want to jump in I do actually have a question. Um, I was reading another paper of yours um, today, actually, the uh, tobacco smoking in three left behind subgroups, um, that paper. Yep. And I was noticing um, there's a section here that I was really interested in. And given the paper that we're, you know, the more recent one that we're talking about that essentially says, you know, the, the public health gains uh, in reference to, you know, reduced smoking are basically not attributable at all really to all of these you know policy changes and campaigns and things that it's more about education than anything else i wondered if for a moment we could talk about you know since there doesn't appear to be any benefit to them what about the consequences of them and there's a portion of your paper that talks about unintended consequences of regressive tobacco control policies the cumulative effect of you know unaffordable tobacco prices fines for smoking, shaming focused on campaigns, discriminatory hiring practices, preventing people who smoke from getting jobs, residential uh, tenancy restrictions. I'm just quoting your paper here, um, creating a level of stress and societal exclusion that actually perpetuates a downward spiral that drives smoking, according to your paper. And I thought that this was a really interesting, you know, if we were if we're showing that they're not actually helping does that make a case for all they're potentially doing in tobacco control is hurting? And, you know, what are the effects of that? And is that something that anyone is going to be talking about? I don't, it's hard to get people to talk about that because it's seen as just being sort of anti-tobacco control and then it gets into a big sort of competition. Um, and, but definitely there, there have been negative consequences. Definitely stigmatizing people is, is opposite to supporting, you know, good mental health. And uh, you've got a fantastic um, Professor Green, I cite in that other paper you looked at, and her theory of poverty. She talks about immobility, that people are kept in poverty. They can't move up because they, they're kept there by, often it's, it's almost death by paper cut. There are so many policies and red tape and fines for this, that and everything else that um, she says they just keep bumping into sharp things. And of course, fines, and I use an example in New Zealand where if somebody who is on low income and you know struggling week to week financially to pay bills and they often are juggling money around, if they, if they miss out on paying their power bill and it gets cut off, they then get fined. Uh, well, it's not called a fine, but to get the power put back on, they get charged a disconnection fee and a, a reconnection fee. And it's like, well, you're just compounding it. They, they already couldn't pay their power bill. And now you're going to basically fine them because you cut it off and fine them again or charge a fee for reconnecting it. So there's this cumulative effect of all of these policies. And I've, I've you know, argued against this sort of siloed approach of public health where they only focus say, on smoking and then you focus on alcohol over there and now you go focus on gambling over there, et cetera. It's completely um, cut into these um, silos. They don't talk to each other and there's a cumulative effect of all of the policies and stigmatization and demonization of people, uh, it's not just looking at what they're doing in tobacco control. 
So Professor Green, I mean, that would be fantastic if you could get her to talk with. And she explains how people are kept in poverty uh, by, you know, and and a, one thing, you could just have one thing that happens like, you didn't pay your power bill and then it gets cut off and then you can't afford to get it reconnected or, and, and there's a spiral effect of, or a knock on domino effect where one thing leads to another. And then they, you know, if they lose their car, for instance, then they can't get to work and then they lose their job and then they can't pay their rent. And so um, that's a really good theory to look at. Um, And the other point, that you kind of have brought up is how is the policies, uh, how are the policies of tobacco control being co-opted really or used for a broader political um, purpose? And we never really talk about that. Um, So I well I'll ask. Um, then, <laughs> um, first of all, I I, I did want to uh, say you know I, one of my questions going into this was about what you know some folks in the in the drug policy reform uh, space have have sort of called the uh, psycho- psych- psychedelic exceptionalism, um, and so I you sort of already answered my question there, which is that um, you know tobacco isn't necessarily special. It's 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 a drug like anything else and um, and and sort of walling it off and and treating it separately uh, isn't really the answer here. Um, And I've noticed at least, you know, here in New York, I don't know if it's nationwide, but uh, we've been seeing uh, sort of alcohol education ads um, that are not stigmatizing, that are not scary. It's it's very simply advice to parents about how to have a conversation with your kids about alcohol. I wish it was expanded to, to all drugs, but um, maybe they only got the funding for alcohol because everything is siloed off. Um, (laughs) But, you know, getting to your, your point, I mean, the the larger point is, is, is how, how is this stuff being used as, as a part part of a larger political agenda? You're asking, (laughs) well, (laughs) well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, obviously back in the 60s, uh, we had like peak smoking prevalence where it was so normal and so many people, I mean, this is what pe- smokers now who are still alive say, everybody smoked, it was in the movies, etc. And so it's been denormalized, it's been uh, sidelined and demonized and that was quite deliberate and certainly in tobacco control, we deliberately set out to demonize nicotine and and then you know and the policies and programs demonized people or or made them look stupid you know belittled them um called them loser and things like that so there were huge mass media campaigns that did that now what we're into now where for example in new zealand we have the you know, human, we have human rights. Um, there are laws against discriminating against people. You're not allowed to discriminate on the basis of ethnicity or gender or ability or, you know, we have a long list. This is wonderful. But the reality is that there are some people who want to discriminate on the basis of those things. And if they can't use, they find another way Um And I've also argued and put the argument forward that smoking has become a proxy for some of those other things. For example, smoking happens to be disproportionately higher among Māori, the indigenous people, Uh, and it's proportionately higher among poor people, and it's proportionately higher among people with mental health illnesses, and it's proportionally higher among people who... Uh, the poorest. So smoking can be used as a proxy by people who do want to discriminate against and who don't want to give a job to that person or those people or don't want to rent their house uh, to certain people, especially uh, those people happen to be among the group that smoke the most. So I think that 
in New Zealand especially, uh, it's you know, there's many examples of it where smoking now can be used as, because it's perfectly legal to deny a person a job if they smoke. It's perfectly fine if you want to deny accommodation to somebody because they smoke. So it's being used as a proxy uh, for discriminating against certain groups. And with professors, Professor Green's theory of poverty, and you see how um, lots of small policies are aimed at keeping certain groups out um, or sidelined or marginalised. Uh, so I think that in terms of smoking, we have to be quite critical and we need to look at what really is the purpose of this or that policy. How is it going to contribute to the marginalisation of the group that happen to have the highest smoking prevalence rates, for instance. Does that explain it? Yeah, for sure. And I, I as you were talking, I was sort of remembering that, you know, here in the States, um, this is this is mainly a, a state level issue uh, where states will allow companies to discriminate against people for their their smoking status or, or nicotine uh, use. Um, I, I think, I, I can't remember if it was West Virginia or Kentucky. It was one of the, the very uh, high smoking prevalence states uh, that, that uh, I can't remember if they left the law alone or they enacted it. This was several years ago, but it basically allowed companies to deny employment to people if they were using any form of nicotine, even NRT. Uh, if, they, if they were smoking at the time that the policy was enacted, I think they had like 90 days to quit or something like that. So it was something very ridiculous. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's codified in certain places here in the States as well. And um, it's, it's good to hear you talk about it. And, and we'll definitely have to look up Dr. Green's work um, because it's so often, I think the attention is uh, very squarely on the, the drug war in the United States. And, and I think a lot of people, you know, we know it's a matter of public record. It was a racist and, and, and classist and, and anti-dissent type of policy. Um, and, and or, you know, yeah, the drug war, all, all told. Um, but, but it's hard for people to make that leap to uh, smoking or other tobacco use. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. And, and I, I do, I do want to give uh, Logan some space here if he has, has any questions to ask. Uh, I do. Um, but first, I, I just wanted to uh, to kind of make that comparison. You know, Dr. Glover, you mentioned that tobacco and, and smoking really is, is kind of used as a proxy against these groups, which is just right out of the drug war playbook. Um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, when we started passing laws in this country, um, we weren't able to necessarily go out and even though in this country, we still do go out and and arrest, uh, you know, people in the black community and things like this simply for the color of their skin. Uh, Nixon's, you know, famous drug war um, is is really based on on a lot of that. We we militarized the police against communities of color in this country, um, and we were able to use, you know, the their their drugs of choice and things like that to to uh, shut down voting and shut down a lot of resources for people. Uh, in that regard. And it's it, it's wild how comparable, you know, policies like that uh, are to the way that we treat people who smoke, and, you know, not just here, but around the world. And so I just wanted to, to kind of, uh, you know, make that comparison, uh, because it, it's, it, it's so true. Uh, but really, my, my, my question really, uh, is, is kind of the title of our our, uh, our, our, our show here and, and is youth smoking over, uh, in, in, uh, you know, in America, our latest numbers really show that smoking, uh, amongst youth and high school is extremely low. We're well below 5%. I believe we're below 2% right now. Um, and I was going to ask you about New Zealand and, and any of the other countries that you have uh, a focus on and really is youth smoking over. Hello. Sorry, I had my microphone turned on. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> one of those Zoom problems. Uh, it's not over, but it's it's pretty much almost over. I mean, 
I think it's quite simple in terms of understanding that smoking is harmful to your health. And here is an alternative that is much less harmful, like way less harmful. We're talking 95% less harmful to your health than smoking a cigarette. So that's a very simple equation that people can do. The kids coming through education systems now, they're a lot smarter than you're coming out of the education system a few decades ago. So they're not dumb. It's a very simple equation. It's a very simple fact. And as long as they have access to a much safer, um, and it's cheaper here in New Zealand at the moment, um, alternative to using something that the delivery mechanism is harmful, you know, like a dirty syringe. Uh, why would you use a dirty syringe if there's a clean, cheap one there? <laughs> so there's, it's very simple. And I think that youth um, get it. They got it before adults got it, really, uh, and here in New Zealand particularly, because, you know, vaping started overseas, but a few people picked it up and then it began to get attention here and younger people understood straight away straight away here's the technology I mean that they're also um, more likely to understand about technologies and I have a lot of our older participants say that you know like yeah younger their younger cousins have showed them how to use a vape etc so yeah the younger people are introducing vaping to their parents to their aunties to their grandparents and that's working and it's um our, our smoking prevalence rate is is plummeting which is fantastic that's that's what you know certainly i wanted to see and i knew that legalizing va uh, re regulating vaping and the government supporting it the government's running a campaign encouraging people who smoke to quit or switch to vaping and it's happening and youth rates are right down, the lowest ever. And I think it's uh, it's very simple. Now, it could all get overturned These uh, with the prohibition on vaping. If the focus shifts to prohib prohibiting vaping, to banning or limiting access to taxing and banning flavours, then they're just going to send youth straight back to tobacco. Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, just in your experience, if New Zealand has seen um, really the uh, the negative effects, I guess, of, of the misinformation that comes out of America. Uh, we know Australia, uh, you know, we, we recently just talked to Dr. Colin Mendelson about how devastating, um, you know, our misinformation, which we are the, in my opinion, we're the world leaders in misinformation exportation um, and how that is is affecting New Zealand and, and, and whatnot compared to, you know, somewhere like Australia where they're, you know, they're highly fined for importing nicotine. It's a prescription only model where no doctors are really even prescribing. And it's, it's really just a mess. And so much of that really does come from um, you know, us here in the, in the States, I'm just curious to see how New, New Zealand is kind of tackling that. Yes, it's, um, we really parted ways with Australia somewhere along the line. Um, and the, the vaping has definitely changed. Uh, cause there used to be an agreement between the governments that they would align their tobacco control policies. So, um, this is really, sent us in very different uh, directions. So the adoption of a harm reduction approach in New Zealand to allow people access to vaping, and we need to recognise that New Zealand did not allow people access to uh, the you know, nicotine pouches to snus or oral nicotine pouches. Uh, the heated tobacco products were regulated 
because you know it went through court and the judge saw that as a tobacco product so it came under the existing regulation for tobacco products so that was a I mean, the Ministry of Health here definitely fought that and tried to say, no, the heated tobacco product is banned, uh, but they that case was thrown out of court. And uh, and so we have, it's you know, it was a long fight. I be, came back from Global Forum on Nicotine at a conference in 2015 and began to, you know, educate, went to see the Ministry of Health and just have pushed and pushed for this, life-saving and, you know, paradigm shifting. We're talking absolute paradigm shift. And that's why in Carl and my paper, we stopped. There's no point going beyond 2010 looking at ECHO's effect because this is a new paradigm now. The ECHO will be from the introduction of vaping and, uh, you know, you need a completely different model for that. So uh, I don't know what can be done about Australia. It really is, it does comes down to some very old um, tobacco control controllers, um, you know, trying to protect their legacy and prohibitionists that have gained control and the upper hand and, and the majority in terms of public health. And it's not just on smoking, you know, they it's your whole Baptist and bootleggers thing, isn't it? So we have them here, and they they've got high up, and they're getting into politics. Uh, they're in the politicians' ears, and we're not facing just prohibition on tobacco and eventually vaping. But you know, they're going after just so many things. You know, alcohol, um, speeding, and it's across the board. And we need to see that what's happening with tobacco, the measures that are being pushed, are not they're not a single case. It's across the board with many other health behaviours as well. What you eat, what you drink, how much you sleep, um, how fast you drive. Hmm. Well... We are coming up at the top of the hour here, and I don't want to keep you too much longer, but um, I do see your pinned tweet uh, about the squirrel program. Um, I'm, I'm curious about this, and, and I, I think it's a good place to kind of wrap things up because I, I, I like to end on, on a solutions note. Um, so would, could you kind of talk a little bit about the, the squirrel program and and and, and how it's going. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, it's very interesting. You know, I think that it could be ahead of its time. It's a, a completely, you know, free online course. And really what I wanted people to understand was nicotine dependency. And even, even with the people who are doing the course, I can see that that Western medical understanding is has been pushed out, you know, probably to the smallest reaches of the world. The the belief or the, the teaching is that addiction is a disease and addiction is a concept. It's not a disease. Um, and so this concept that addiction is a disease and from there leads to all of that, you know, war on drugs and uh, pathologizing people and uh, looking down on people, belittling them or seeing them as weaker, etc. So all of that undermines what I call a therapeutic relationship. Um, and then vape shops, this revolution, this, this paradigm shift to having vape shops and peer-to-peer support to switch from smoking to vaping was just mind-blowing and and just so fantastic to me and it meant that say a person coming into a vape shop and and they and that the person behind the counter was a smoker and has has switched to vaping and they're passionate and they they're equals it's an equal it's a peer-to-peer model and there is none of that condescending, I'm the expert, you're the sick one uh, part of it, which is what you 
get with some doctors and counsellors and smoking cessation services. And so when you look at why are the smoking cessation services, why has tobacco control done so poorly and why are smoking cessations got such low efficacy rates? So what I wanted to try and do was put into the course some understanding the latest theory around dependency rather than using the word addiction and try and get it out there because the old theory that everyone's going off is is out of date and it's been criticised and it's flawed. But that's what they're continuing to use. Um, it's very hard when people have been schooled in one theory and paradigm. That's what they believe. It's very hard to introduce them to another one. So my course is aimed at uh, community health workers uh, in Indigenous communities, low middle income countries, vape shop workers, tobacconists even who have hybrid stores and sell all the products, people who haven't been trained in the Western medical system and are therefore not don't have that old theory of addiction as a disease and, you know, this person's sick and I'm here to help them, you know, ingrained in them. Uh, and but I'm using gamification as the main teaching tool because didactic, you know, sort of chalk and talk, um, I'll tell you and you listen and then you'll know what to do. Methods also have their limitations and uh, are not for everybody. So I used gamification as the main teaching tool. You Module one is about the teachers about dependency on smoking tobacco and you play a game. There are three games with three different characters. It's just teaching all of the aspects of the theory, but you don't know it. You don't know that. <laughs> but uh, so one advocate had a go at it at just to pilot it for me. And he says, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I got anything out of it. And so I started to ask him questions. Well, what did you think this meant? Or what did you think this aspect of the game meant? And he totally got it. He totally got it. So... I know it kind of works. It doesn't work that well for people trained in the medical, Western medical addiction as a disease theory, uh, but it works for people coming from outside of health. Uh, and the really, you know, I'm really thrilled that some of the feedback from participants who are helping to with the trial of the course is that they would they would stick in there longer with people. You know, they would listen more and they feel like they have more empathy or compassion and boy if we could get more empathy and compassion in this world uh that would make a huge change i i think you're exactly right um and and just to be clear so this is this is pretty much open to all who are interested you don't have to be from new zealand no it's uh i you know, I'm currently trialing it, so I do have a criteria for people, you know, to take part in the study of it. But I'm really open to, uh, you know, especially advocates. I just need feedback on it, really. So even just sort of like as a pilot or piloting it for me and giving me feedback on this and that, especially, um, yeah, it, it just all helps during that development phase. Fantastic. Well, I, I don't know uh, how much we're going to, to drive participation, but uh, certainly glad that we had the opportunity to talk about it. And, um, and, and I think it's I, I think all of your points are absolutely excellent. And um, uh, not having a kumbaya moment here, I think it's very practical that anything that can increase empathy and understanding of what people are going through is is going to go a lot longer than beating them over the head. Um, so, uh, before we wrap it up, I just want to give everybody a, a, one last opportunity for any burning questions. I don't, I don't have any more questions for you, um, but I do just want to thank you not only for, for your work, but you know, for, for lack of a better term, really just giving a shit about people uh, and, and your compassion and treating people with the dignity that they deserve, regardless of you know, the, whether they're smoking or the drugs that they use, um, you're, you know, uh, distinguishing really between addiction and dependency and, and, and just this whole conversation. I really just want to thank you, uh, from the bottom of my heart, um, for all that you do. Um, and I, I, 
I hope that you don't stop anytime soon. Oh, thank you, Logan. So thank you. I hope I get to. Yeah, get thanks so much to, for coming yeah. on. Yeah, and, and in that vein, uh, you know, the same same to you, uh, Dr. Glover. Uh, is is there anything that uh, you'd like to maybe plug or, or or something maybe we didn't we didn't focus on enough in the hour? No, I uh, no, I really appreciate uh, your help and you know interest in our work. It's it's like um, you know we put it out there. It's so hard to get cut through now, especially when you're you know blacklisted when there's a deliberate sort of campaign to demonize you know me to demonize my work to you know because of where I got funding from the foundation for a smoke free world and you know i all i can say is that i maintain my independence i'm you know i have my integrity and i'm doing the best that i can i felt that i could make um, I could make a difference. I could continue on my career's work, but extend out to other Indigenous people in the world. And you're quite right. There are some other Indigenous people in tobacco control, but they're very much singing from the same song sheet. I mean, as soon as you start singing from a different song sheet or start challenging the, you know, the white um, mainstream tobacco control professors, you're out. And, uh, you know, so... It's a it's a very tough road to you know to have the marginalised uh, people, the people who are being denied their dignity and are being treated in very undignified ways, um, to speak up for them. And thank you guys for everything you do too. And boy, it's just been as as I said, a par complete paradigm shift. The vaping community to have people consumers uh, rise up and become so powerful in this debate because people who smoked occasionally tried but never, ever were able to become as big and as important a voice as you guys have what you've been able to do. And I'm just so thankful that you keep doing what you're doing because consumers, you know, nothing about us without us, consumers – really have been so disempowered by public health across the board, not just with tobacco. So, you know, we've got to work together and um, I'd like to support you and I just hope that – I know burnout and all of that, you know, just keep going. You're so – it's the way of the future. Consumers must not be um, silenced the way uh, public health has managed to do for the last – over the last 30 years. Well, thank you for that. And, and again, thank you for all of your work. We're glad to have you on, on the team. Uh, it's not our team. It's all of us working together. And, and I deeply appreciate your work. And, and thank you again for, for coming on and talking with us. Um, and with that, I think we'll, we'll uh, bring this uh, Twitter space to a close. Uh, if you're joining late and you want to listen to the whole thing, this will immediately be available on Twitter, I believe, for the next 30 days. Uh, and somewhere between now and next week, we'll get the original recording and we'll put it up on our SoundCloud for you. Uh, while you're there, you can check out our uh, weekend podcast that we do every Saturday, with the exception, of course, of this Saturday. I am going on a little, little bit, little tiny road trip, uh, so I won't be around, but we'll be back the following Saturday. It'll be the first Saturday in the next month. Uh, that is May. I still have to count those on my fingers. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, go check out our website, kasa.org, C-A-S-A-A.org. While you're there, please note, we do have a big donation button. We accept donations. Uh, and we have some uh, all the information and links to things. We've got a books section if you want to read books about all the stuff that we're talking about. Um, and uh, a weekly uh, weekly kind of news and information roundup that, that Kristen Noel Marsh puts together for us. Um, all kinds of resources available. And of course, the ever popular calls to action for your state or municipality or at the federal level where ugly things are always happening. Um, and I think I covered all the bit. Logan, did I cover all? Did I, did I say all the things? You forgot about merch. 
I, did I forget about I, it? Was in my head. We have merch. <laughs> we have, we have, I just I just didn't want Danielle to yell at me. Okay. If, uh, if I do appreciate it. The, I do appreciate we left it. Out the merchandising. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. While you're over at the website, anybody uh, and you want to check out some sweet swag that our own El Presidente Danielle has designed herself. Uh, they're awesome. They're cool. Not only can you support the cause, support Casa. But you also get to be a walking billboard for tobacco harm reduction. And I think that is just nifty. <laughs> also, I think we yeah, the there is a sale on the shop right now. If you happen to listen to this today, it does end uh, tomorrow, the 28th at 5 p.m. Central. But if you listen to this before then, get you, save you some money on some sweet, sweet merch, you guys. <laughs> and if you're like me, Thursday is payday. That's a great day to pick up some swag. <laughs> excellent all right well the the one last thing i forgot was thank you to everyone who joined us uh it looks like some of y'all checked out early but um sticking around for thank yous sometimes can be boring uh so thanks everybody for joining us everybody listening on the replay and once again a special thanks to dr marijuana glover uh not only for joining us but for all of your work and continued efforts um we really appreciate it uh and everybody have a good night thank you thank you